Steroid Mistakes Part 2, The Physical Exam. The intention of this video is mainly to teach and educate caregivers, doctors, and medical health professionals around the world how to conduct a physical exam specifically for someone that's using performance enhancing drugs and specifically anabolic steroids. Um, this is what I've learned over the past 15 years or so in doing so as an expert internal medicine doctor. Um, as physicians know, there is a standard physical exam. I use that, of course, in this. It's very thorough and it should be very formatted. It should be a regular, specific way, head to toe, um, and we should not deviate from that. But again, I'm going to give pointers for physicians and also, of course, for patients that they should realize when they're having a physical exam, these are the things that an expert is looking for. So every physical exam starts off with what we uh, determine and call a general observation, which is the patient's demeanor, the patient's grooming and the patient's well-groomed or how the patient just comes in the room and looks or how the doctor comes in and reads the patient. That's very important. The next piece is the vital signs. This is part of the physical exam. It actually precedes the physical exam. This is incredibly important for a person who's using anabolic steroids. There's the weight and the height. Of course, there's a visual acuity in both eyes. And then it goes into hearing. Again, these are important pieces, but they're not so focused on a steroid user, as you can imagine. Temperature is, pulse rate is, respiratory rate, and I even have saturations where you can get a pulse monitor and check someone's oxygenation, arterial saturation. The temperature and the pulse and the respiration rate is very important, in my opinion. If you're on steroids and you have uh, direct or indirect heart disease, uh, your pulse rate can be high. Anything over a pulse rate in the 70s is actually abnormal. It doesn't have to be over 90. If your pulse rate is in the 80s, that's abnormal. If your resting heart rate's in the 80s, that's, that's not right. That's going to be abnormal. Uh, any cardiologist will agree with this. Um, if your pulse rate's elevated and maybe your temperature's slightly elevated, maybe they're sick, maybe they have an abscess, maybe they're on clenbuterol. Um, and these are issues that are very important to, to note, and that's the history side. Respiration, if they're rapidly respirating, if they're tachypnic, maybe they're sick, or maybe, again, they have heart disease or they're on some other medications. Um, blood pressure, very important. I talk about it all the time, heart rate and blood pressure. So you want to make sure you take the blood pressure seated like this in a position where the patient is seated, the both legs are on the ground and the arms are supported, and you want to get a blood pressure cuff that is going to be large enough for the arm. Obviously, we're seeing a lot of uh, large men, not necessarily, but you want to make sure the blood pressure cuff fits. Next piece, those are the vital signs, is the skin. You want to look at someone's skin. You're probably going to be just looking at their face and their neck at that point, but you want to uh, potentially uh, strip them down to their underwear or put a Johnny coat on and take a look at their skin. What are you looking for? Acne. Anabolic steroids lead to acne on many people, so you want to be aware of the acne and you want to discuss the acne and talk about the acne with the patient. Infections, side infections. Anabolic steroids are mainly, apart from pills, are intermuscularly injected. So we're going to classically see over the years abscesses and chronic sterile abscesses. This is classic. In, in the upper, in the lateral glute region. And if you look at professional bodybuilders, actually, I noticed at Mr. Olympia this year, I noticed that there's some guys have fixed uh, abscesses. And those are probably sterile abscesses. They're not infected. They're just masses and fibrotic tissue that are sterile abscesses. I, I give a shout out to Dr. T, who's an expert in this and is a pathologist in Greece, and he has a whole chapter in Bill DeWellen's Anabolics, the 11th edition, just about abscesses from intermuscular steroids. Next piece is the head. So you look for an atraumatic or traumatic head or any issues of the head, and you think of hair loss. Steroids lead to hair uh, pattern balding for men, and you want to address that and make notes on that. Next piece is the eyes, icterus, which is called jaundice. So you don't see it that often, but if a man's on oral steroids, it affects his liver. He could have what's, what's called uh, hyperbilirubinemia, and that's jaundice. 
and we see that classically related to bilirubin levels that are certainly over 2.5 to 3 milligrams per deciliter. Next piece is we go by the ears, the nose, the mouth, and the throat. It's not really relevant. Uh, the neck, uh, the neck exam is though in the thyroid. So you want to look and check for the thyroid. You want to palpate that and check for nodular goiters or nodules. Remember, some of these patients are using thyroid extracts, and that can affect a goiter, a goiter, or it can affect the size and shape of the thyroid. And you just want to check for the thyroid anyway. It's part of the physical exam. Next piece on the neck is JVD. So jugular venous distension. If the patient's laid back about 30 degrees on the on the the, uh, the exam table, you can see there could be an extended jugular venous distension. Again, that's a classic sign for someone who has maybe uh, heart disease, congestive heart failure, or the prestates. Next piece is lymphatic. You want to look in the head of the neck for lymph nodes in the submandibular and the posterior anterior part of the neck. And then you want to go uh, lymph nodes under the axilla and then even in the lower part of the groin um, for people. Maybe they have some other condition while they're coming in. Unfortunately, very rarely a lymphoma. Or maybe they have an, an site infection and they have an, uh, in the arm or the leg and they have a, a, a lymph adenopathy. You want to check for these things. This is very thorough. Next piece is the breast. Classically, gynecomastia. You want to check and palpate the breast right around the nipple and not to mention around it and deep to the nipple. And you'll see, you'll feel gynecomastia. You want to make sure that it's not a, a, a cancerous potentially. The truth is I've never seen breast cancer, thank God, secondary to steroids, which we would think potentially with super physiologic androgens and leading to estrogen levels, maybe we're going to have uh, an increase in breast cancer. We don't. It's probably because the androgen itself is, is, is uh, competing with that. I mean, if you look for the history, we've used decadrabo and other anabolic steroids to protect women and people, actually men, rarely from breast cancer once they've been diagnosed. Very interesting. Despite that, you want to feel the gyno. You'll, see, you'll feel gyno on men on steroids. They have gyno unless they have it removed. They have plastic surgery and they have it removed. So that's a big piece. You also, at this point, want to take an opportunity to look at the body habitus. Some men will just have... They think they have gyno, but they don't. They actually, the doc, I have gyno, and they don't. They just have fatty mass around the breast, and everyone's different. These are, you don't ever criticize someone or make fun of someone for their body habitus. They're not all perfect uh, creatures, people. So they, they may have some fat around their, their breast tissue and their pecs, and you want to be honest and say to them, that's not gyno, that's your body habitus, and that's just the way you're built. And uh, despite losing weight, Despite exercise and training and firming, uh, some men won't uh, achieve a breast that they feel comfortable with. So you want to make sure you say it's important to know that and feel okay with that and then maybe refer them to plastic surgery. Again, this is very thorough and this is just giving everything that I've seen over the years. So you want to make sure you, you, you really check the breast carefully with that. Next is respiratory. You, you want to observe the breathing. As I said before, now you want to listen to the, the, the lungs and you want to listen for crackles, rapid breathing, wheezing. So there's going to be heart disease that relates now to the heart and the lung exam. You want to, someone may have intrinsic asthma, extrinsic asthma. They may have COPD. They may have some breathing issues. So you want to always listen to the lungs in the upper and lower. And physicians certainly know how to, to do this and document a proper lung exam. Next is cardiac. This is probably the most important piece. So you want to, again, you want to be aware of the heart rate. You want to now lay the patient down. You can sit them up first and lean forward. You can listen to the heart that way. You can lean back and listen to the classic oscultary sights with a stethoscope. And you want to detect and make note on murmurs, regurgitation, and gallops. Again, doctors, this is the same as exam for anyone else. You want to pay attention to maybe these men are leading into heart failure. Maybe they had a myocardial infarction and they have some other abnormalities in their heart and you in left ventricle uh, LVH. Again, if you're a very good physician and clinician, you could detect this early. Of course, you always will have to refer to a cardiologist or to get some other testing in ECG, echocardiography, calcium scores, and refer out to other experts. But you want to pay attention to the nature of the heart sounds here. Very, very important. Next one is the abdomen. Is the abdomen soft and non-tender? Can you uh, appreciate any hepatosplenia megalia? 
uh, megaly. So that's an enlarged liver, an enlarged spleen, and they have an abdomen that is distended besides listening to the bowel sounds. This is very important. Now, this day and age with, with, with uh, CT scans and, and ultrasounds and an MRI technology, most physicians are not very adept at, at picking up and, and feeling at, for an enlarged liver or spleen. I've actually felt it more in the hospital with people that have cancer, but I've never felt it on an enlarged liver on a steroid user. We just don't see that, thank God. But again, that's why we have the labs. So you're marrying these things together. So very important. And when you're feeling also for the back, you may want to just palpate the back. A lot of guys talk about back pumps from steroid use affecting the kidney. Very interesting phenomenon. Maybe they don't have back pumps. Maybe they, they just have a, a swollen uh, kidney from a hydronephrosis or an infection or a kidney stone. I've seen all these things, very complicated. Next piece, we move down from the abdomen into the pelvis and the, the genital urinary region, and that's going to be focused on the penis and the testicles. You're classically going to see atrophy testicles. You want to make sure you feel if it's a young man, he's at risk for testicular cancer anyway. It's a young man. You want to palpate the testicles properly. You want to make sure he understands how to do the same for himself. Uh, especially for t testicular cancer, but you're going to appreciate atrophy testicles or a, a testicle that's, that's pulled up, that's sucked up into the, the pelvis. Men are very particular about this, I've noticed, very particular about the way their testicles are sitting, maybe too long, too, too loose, maybe after steroids, the consistency is not there, it's painful, it's numb, or it, the sensation is very bothersome. The quality of life in this part of the exam is huge. You want to have, be comfortable uh, with this patient. You want to make sure you assess that and talk to them as you're assessing it and really feel. Do you feel your testicles are atrophied based compared to a baseline before? Really, this is very important here. Um, and of course, we have digital rectal examination. So for any man who's 40 or 45 in the United States, we do digital rectal examination for prostate cancer and for rectal screening cancer. We, t we just take a look and that's part of the exam. It's important to do, but you're, when you're doing PSAs on these men that are say 40 and up with testosterone, you, you have to correlate all this and you may want to rely on a expert urologist for this. I do uh, frequently uh, to make sure that everything is okay. This is very specific here. So uh, moving out of the general uh, urinary region, we move into the musculoskeletal, which is going to be the upper limbs, obviously the neck itself, the back, the pelvis itself, the hips, the knees, and the, the lower extremities. And this is for disability, injuries, tor uh, knee injuries, back injuries, and you want to um, do a complete exam on this, obviously. Next is peripheral vascular. The peripheral vascular exam is very important to look for blood flow in the extremities. For an example, the lower limbs, uh, uh, classic for ankle edema, for steroid users, even men and testosterone. Some of it can be pathological and some can be actually benign, but a nuisance. Um, androgens definitely cause, cause intravascular edema, and you'll see that edema third space in the lower ankles, the lower limbs. It's important to look at vascular issues as well, is cyanosis and bad circulation, not to mention in the hands itself, uh, but also more classically in the lower limbs. Very important. So if a man has the beginnings of heart failure or such a sleep apnea, or again, on steroids and this is progressing, you'll look at the lower limbs and you'll see uh, this manifest down there. And we have ways, as doctors know, <coughs> to, to detect and to to format and record how bad the edema is in the lower limbs. Uh, pitting edema, it's called actually. So that's very important. The next piece is neurologic and mental status. This is very important where you wanna then conclude how the patient's doing as far as alert and orientation to time, place, if the patient's nervous, if the patient has uh, expressed um, anxiety or depression, um, very, very important. Um, there could be other medicines involved like clenbuterol, diuretics, thyroid preparations, other performance enhancing drugs that lead to a change in mental status, not to mention opioids, pain medicines, and uh, a host of other medicines. 
So this is the part that you conclude with a neurologic and a mental status examination. <clears throat> that concludes the part two and concludes a physical exam, including vital signs, how it should be done focused for anabolic steroid user. The next part will be part three and part four. Please uh, stay tuned for those and I really hope this helps everyone on steroids and caregivers who are going to see anabolic steroid and performance enhancing drug use among their patients. So please leave a comment, please contact me uh, and my staff in the office at metabolicdoc.com. Of course, anabolicdoc.com. Please feel free to watch us on the videos at Anabolic Doc on YouTube and at Muscular Development. I'm featured more and more in muscle fitness and I'm very happy and fortunate that I have this ability to continue to work on something that's so meaningful to me. Thank you so much. Dr. Thomas O'Connor here. I'm glad you made it to the end of the video. If you liked it, hit the like button and please subscribe to our channel. And I look forward to bringing you more cool and interesting videos just like this in the future. Stay strong and healthy.